The first is going to be uh, Dr. Nina Wallerstein, and um, she's a professor of public health at the University of New Mexico. Um, she's been developing participatory research methodologies and empowerment intervention research for more than 30 years. Um, she's written books, co-edited volumes, and written over 120 different articles and chapters on the topic of, of community-based participatory research. Um, since 1999, she has worked on uh, worked in collaboration with tribal communities to assess strengths of community capacity, public health infrastructure, and intergenerational cultural centered interventions to reduce child risky behaviors and in, with several uh, New Mexico tribes. I met Nina at a conference in San Francisco um, that was based on training individuals to prepare to do community-based research and I was so impressed with her work we actually went ahead and wrote a grant together. And, uh, and so it's been a, a wonderful uh, evolution of a relationship with her ever since. I can't think of anyone better to help us, un, you know, to ground us all in a common understanding of what we mean when we talk about community-engaged research. She'll be followed by a, a second speaker who is from our community here locally. Uh, probably doesn't need an introduction to most of you, uh, Rogelio Riojas is the president and CEO of CMAR Community uh, Centers uh, that uh, have been in, in functioning since 1978. CMAR is a health and human services nonprofit organization committed to providing quality, comprehensive health, human and housing services to diverse communities, specializing in service to Latinos. Under his leadership, the organization has grown from a small community clinic in South Park neighborhood in Seattle to a large multifaceted health and human services organization serving more than 240,000 individuals annually across 10 different counties. Uh, notably, uh, Mr. Riojas is a uh, regent of the University of Washington. Congratulations to him, and, and, and um, we're so happy to have him there. He's a graduate of the University of Washington with, a, with degrees in uh, economics and political science and a master's in health administration. So I know a little bit about uh, Rogelio. He grew up in uh, the Yakima Valley. Uh, he's the son of farm workers. And, uh, you know, he came through in the 1970s uh, when there was a lot of uh, uh, change going on in our community and, and civil rights. And he's a leader from that time and a leader still today. So it's wonderful to have him here. And, um, and so we'll start with Nina and then we'll have some comments from, from, from uh, Rogelio about this kind of work. Thank you. Thank you, Leo, and I'm really delighted to be doing this in combination with Rogelio, so it's just such an opportunity. An opportunity. Muchísimas gracias. Okay, and it's just... So I'm going to be talking somewhat about this approach of CBPR, community-based participatory research, how it's based in a set of principles and our work, and then talk a little bit about our national study of promising practices nationwide, and then end with a short case study of... One of the case studies that we looked at, which is a Latino um, EJ environmental justice partnership in New Mexico, and kind of show how kind of some of promising practices can be um, seen in practice. Um, so I start with myself. One of the canons of good research is that it should never hurt the people that is that are studied. I think this is a lot more difficult. Um, Cheryl Crazy Bull, president of Northwest Indian College, from here, actually, um, this is her quote. Um, and I just, this just, I just think about this all the time. You know, how do you re do this kind of work in partnership and not do something that is creating harm? And I go back to Paulo Freire also to be a good educator. He didn't say researcher, but means above all to have faith in people and to believe in the possibility that they, we together, can create and change things. And it goes back to when I dropped out of college in the early 70s and started working in East San Jose in, in California, teaching English as a second language and incorporating Freire's ideas in work with Latinos that I were, was doing at that time. So Freire has stayed with me all of these decades as an important inspiration. Um, so just for a couple things of the rationale of why CBPR, of course there's a historic mistrust in communities. We know that. There's a challenge of this bringing, as we so eloquently heard from 
um, just previously to me that uh, bringing evidence to practice that internal validity is not enough. You need to think about if something works with a white population in Chicago, it can't just come to a rural Latino population in um, Yakima Valley. It has to be adapted, recentered in the culture and community that is here. And so this importance of not just taking something that's evidence-based is critical premise of CBPR. And also, as Gino eloquently said, the challenge of what is evidence one of my pet peeves is people saying there is academic evidence and cultural beliefs. I hate that. There is academic evidence and there is community evidence. And how do you bridge these two evidences is what we're really talking about when we're talking about CBPR and partnering. And how do you tr really create opportunity for sustainability and policy change and action, which again is the premise of this center. So we know about historical um, abuse with Tuskegee. Many of you may not know we have a colleague in the audience, Dr. Lisa Kakari Stone, who wrote a beautiful piece on rethinking research ethics where she documents a set of medical interventions and research interventions that were quite damaging to Latino populations, whether it was in San Antonio with placebos to Mexican American women. They didn't know they were getting placebos, whether it's experimental measles vaccine. There's evidence. It's a beautiful piece. And if you want to talk to her about it, you, she's here in this next day um, with us. Um, so there's important understanding of we don't want helicopter research. We don't want mosquito research. In urban communities, it's called sometimes drive-by research. You don't want those kind of researchers where um, it's data is just taken or and used to abuse. So what are we talking about? And we do have a definition from the Clinical Translational Science Centers of community engagement, of working collaboratively. We also have some principles of community engagement that have both been translated from English and into Spanish. If you haven't seen this resource, it's very helpful in terms of thinking about what, uh, and it's downloadable from the internet. Um, and there's a continuum here of looking at one end is outreach all the way through to shared leadership. I, in fact, to be honest, do not think that outreach is what we're talking about. I think outreach is the wrong way to um, think because that has nothing to do with a shared learning. So I don't like that this continuum starts with outreach. I wish the continuum would start with more and involve and move closer, not just to shared leadership, but also to community-driven research is another way to extend that continuum. And so I go to this um, very short little uh, on in with that myself and colleagues, again, Lisa Kakari Stone being one of them, have developed at the New Mexico CARES, our own health disparity center, um, where many of us do research on communities, on target populations. Some of us do research in community settings, um, schools, hospitals, clinics, and what would it be like if we're moving ourselves to research with rather than even in? What does that mean to us when we think about the with? So it just helps us to say, what does it mean, with, with, with? Um, and going back to CBPR, this definition from Kellogg has been much more helpful to me as a collaborative approach. It talks about equitably involving all partners in the research process recognizes, again, as Gino mentioned, the strengths that the community brings, as well as academics brings, and the aim of combining knowledge for social action, for change, and to eliminate health disparities. Again, this is a, a core um, definition I return to a lot. Recognizes a set of principles, community as a unit of identity. We should generate collaborative, cooperative learning processes, long-term commitment. I heard a call for long-term commitment to the end of our lives, so thank you very much. Um, and having been given the gift of having the opportunity to work with tribal partners for many, many years now, I've learned a lot. And the tribal sovereignty, of course, of course adds the extra attention to um, working across governments to governments, and there's requirements. You can't just walk into a tribe. You have to have permission and approval. We should think about that with every community we work with. So I just ask you to think about what would it be like if we had to really recognize and ask permission, really provide ownership of data to the community with our community partners, rather than it just be only with tribal populations that they get to exert sovereignty. So that is another um, 
thought process of what's uh, a good practice. I want to couch this now in um, the rest of my talk in a national study that we've been involved with at University of New Mexico, also University of Washington with Bonnie Duran and the um, National Congress of American Indians Policy Research Center with Malia Villegas as the overall PI, where we looked across the country and we said, what is it that makes for effective CBPR? What's effective partnering? What does it mean to do it well? What are the facilitators and barriers of this academic clinic relationships, academic community relationships, academic school relationships? And we developed a model we test to test this model um, to look at the associations between what is the added value when you add participation? Participation, what does it change in terms of outcomes? And then to identify some promising practices. So we've just come off of a four-year study, and then we had a three-year pilot to that. So a seven-year process, and we hope to keep going with this. As Leo just mentioned, we have a grant together to keep going. Um, Dr. Lu Julie Lucero is in the room with uh, here as well from New Mexico, who's a part of this team. So what we have been able to accomplish within this window is we have a model, which I'll show you. We did a literature review of different ways to measure and assess our own partnering practices. Are we doing it well? You know, we can, we can say we're partnering, but would you want to partner again? You know, you, sometimes you have experiences you don't want to do again. So if you're partnering well. So there are measures of that. We've developed our own protocols of how do we share data, how do we own data, who owns the data, how do we share publication, all of that. Those are very important kind of um, agreements to have. We collected data on 200 partnerships around the country with internet surveys, and then we, we did seven in-depth case studies, and we've had a series of publications. So this is our model. It actually is not very complicated. <laughs> looks complicated, but it isn't. So if you look on the left, it says context. We know that all work, all practice, all clinical endeavors, and all research occurs in a context, whether it's the socioeconomic status of the community, whether it's the policy trends, is funding going up or down for this kind of research, the historic collaboration of trust and mistrust between partners, that's a context. The community's capacity to partner, the clinic's capacity to partner, the university's capacity to partner. Does the university have the ethics in place and the right kind of requirements? I work a lot in tribal communities, as I said, in working with the Navajo Nation Institutional Review Board. We have to insert in our IRB applications and protocols that we will provide community benefit. That's not a typical IRB request. Typical IRB is, you know, it won't harm the individual and the benefit is good for the individual. But to provide community benefit, community education, community technical assistance, that would allow for the university to change if we were required to do that. So that's, a, that's the university's capacity and, of course, the health issue. So all research occurs in a context. The, the oval in the middle of group dynamics, if it's a partnership, we're all partnering together. We all have relationships, who's making the decisions, how are resources shared. There's sort of the structural issues of do you have memory MOUs? Do you have agreements and guidelines of how you're working together? How formal do you want to be? How informal do you want to be? And then, of course, we as individuals matter. I always say you don't want every, any person to go out in the community. There's a lot of people who should never leave the university. They shouldn't be out. So you need people who are willing to be flexible, willing to change their timelines based on community priorities, willing to kind of learn from the community, listen, and listen more. So you need individuals who have, a, have the capacity to work in this kind of way. So there's all these characteristics that go into partnering. So if you have partnering, then you have to assume that that changes the intervention and it changes the research design. If you don't have partnering, you just do what you want as an academic. But if you have partnering and the clinic says, you know, we can't reach that kind of population or that's not the right sample, we can't, you have to change your sample. You have to have input from the community partners who may know the particulars of that setting of what's doable. So that will change based on the partnering. So that I, the oval of intervention and research comes next. And then if it's changed by the partnering, then the outcomes also, we hope, will change. The outcomes may be the specific design of increased colorectal cancer screening or the increased 
grant of obesity um, intervention for school kids or um, mental health depression, new protocols inserted in a, in, a, a, in a setting, in a clinic setting. All of that may be the specific grant outcome, but you also, if you're really partnering, you'll have the capacity to really be embedded in the local context. And that issue of sustainability is much more likely because the dangers of research are always is that the grant ends. When the grant ends, what's carried forward? So you have to think about sustainability from the beginning. <coughs> and so if there's partnering, the capacity to embed it in, institutionalize and sustain it is much greater. The capacity to change policies and practices could be greater. The research capacity of your partner will grow, grow, grow if they're involved in the research. And the personal benefits, we've had many partners who are going back to school, who have learned a lot of research skills in our, in our own partnerships. And of course, then we hope then with all those capacity changes, health improves and equity is improved. So it's a pretty simple model, right? <laughs> Our study actually has been testing this model. We take it to community groups and they get it if you just talk through it. It's not like, I mean, it looks very full. It does look very full. So let me just tell you a little bit about the study and then move to our case study. So um, we did this inter we did this survey of 200, 300 partnerships around the country, 200 or so responded. Um, we looked at variability across many, many dimensions in this model. We tried to look at associations between partnering and outcomes. Um, these are the two sets of surveys that we asked. We asked for to the PI to answer demographics, how do they share resources, funding, do they do IRB testing with the do the community partners also, do they do the um, confidentiality IRB training? We looked at partner research roles. How much is the community involved in data collection? Um, data, first of all, generating the research question, data collection, data analysis, data interpretation, data dissemination. Community members can actually be involved in all processes, even if academics are doing the statistical um, pack, the statistical analysis, still the interpretation of it is very key for community partners. And we looked at approvals. In the community engaged survey, which went to more partners of the partnership, we also asked their perceptions of the partnership capacity, their perceptions of how aligned are the community and academics with a set of principles? Are they working together well? What are their values? What are their power dynamics? Who's um, developing you know, decision making and dialogue? Julie Lucero has been very active in a trust, new development of a trust typology. What kind of trust exists within this partnership? We then looked at outcomes, partnership synergy being the most proximal. Is the partnership working together better if you have good decision making, if you have good sharing of resources, if you have MOUs in place? We looked at cultural centeredness as an outcome. Is the intervention or work really centered in that culture? We looked at some concrete outcomes of policy, system changes, health system changes, um, community level transformations. We also look very importantly at personal changes of people in the partnership. Are they growing in their education and their job skills and their research skills and agency outcomes? Is the agency growing in its, in its, in its skills at addressing the disparities of the population and health outcome? So we try to capture what are the processes and what are the outcomes. In the case studies, we looked a little bit deeper. How do these contexts and partnerships, processes, and meanings shape effective CBPR and produce outcomes? And in each of the case studies, we did a site visit with interviews, with focus groups. We did a historical timeline. And we um, have kept in touch with them over the years as well. These are the seven case studies that we did. One of them is actually here in Washington, a youth life skills substance abuse um, called Healing of the Canoe. And I'll be talking about the South Valley Partnership for Environmental Justice. I want to talk about two concepts and then move to the case study. For trust, we developed um, this typology together, and then Julie Lucero did this major investigation from a quantitative perspective and a qualitative perspective on what is the level of trust between community members, and can it change? How does it change over the life of a partnership? This, again, is our current um, trust typology with this idea of critical or reflective trust at the top. The idea that someone has your back. You can make mistakes. We all make mistakes. 
but they, you don't, it doesn't break the relationship if you make mistakes, versus no trust. Proxy trust, again, people vouch for you. I might not know anybody in that community, but someone who knows me will vouch for me. And that matters. So these kind of different uh, typologies. And in terms of her own research, Julie's research, the idea that there's a beginning of the partnership with often proxy trust or mistrust, but it can move up and changes through time can happen through what she's calling communication ethics, commitment, participation, co-learning, and she's had a lot of, uh, we, um, put it, she's writing this up at this point. And again, in the quantitative survey, you see those partnerships, those 200 partnerships at the beginning show this critical reflective trust is pretty low. And you see them documenting or perceiving that it has grown in the course of the partnership to a pretty high level. So trust can change, and trust then influences some of the outcomes. So again, it's a really key. A lot of people are talking about trust. There's a CDC also, Prevention Research Center, assessment of trust. It's an important part of partnering. Another important part of partnering is cultural centeredness, and we talk about it in two ways, kind of what extent is the community voice involved in the decision making, and also to what extent does the project fit within the cultural knowledge, cultural evidence. And just as an example, I was driving down the Navajo Nation and I captured this billboard. Have you noticed a change in your harmony, breath, energy? It may be TB. You wouldn't see this billboard here. This is Everything is centered in that culture of harmony, breath, and energy. So just to, again, it's real to center something in a local community. And cultural centeredness matters in terms of sustainability as an outcome, personal benefits, agency benefits, and health outcomes. This is a composite outcome of a set of practices that seem to be mattering. That if the partner has capacity in the beginning, that helps. So the, what the capacity of the clinic, the capacity of your community setting, community organization. That if there's an alignment with principles between partners, it helps produce outcomes. If the community members are involved in the research tasks, this one came up significant of data collection, it shows they're actively involved in the research as a proxy for capacity. The degree to which partners have impact on the partnership, they actually have their voices being heard, that helps with outcomes. Um, leadership helps. Resource management is the idea that the PI is um, sharing the, find, that there's a doing good, effective uh, management. Written agreements help with outcomes. So think about that in your own partnerships. Written agreements, what are you doing with protocols with, um, Control of resources, that the shared control seems to work best. And then the bridging social capital, the capacity of the academic team to connect to the community, whether they're from the same ethnic racial identity or they have the skills to c connect. These are a set of promising practices to think about in your own work as you move forward. So for two minutes here, the South Valley Partners for Environmental Justice had two sets of funding from NIEHS, the Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, First were the county and the UNM, the university was the PI. The second funding, the PI went to the community. Shared resources, change of resources. So that's an indication. You can see the partners below. South Valley, very rural, but also and in terms of New Mexico, 73% Hispanic. We have about a 39%, or maybe it's more now, 41% Hispanic in the state. So South Valley, Mountain View area, this is higher. Um, in addition to that beautiful rural, scenes a site of heavy pollution and Superfund sites. So this is what they were confronting, an environmental justice I goal to address the pollutant industries, and they built this whole um, mapping of environmental hazards, providing voice through promotores and trainings and input into development of a Mountain View sector plan. We developed a historical timeline with them that looked at where the context they were starting from, this mix of polluting context, but the strengths of the South Valley, the cultural strengths of the South Valley. We saw how they moved from a UNM and county control to community control as a 
best practice, emerging best practice, and a sharing of resources, and the training of the promotores, the, the bridging social capital then of those promotores to work in that community. So we saw several emerging and best practices that were really important here. And putting it all in one timeline really is fascinating to partnerships to get this back, to see themselves grow, then they can see how they can go into the future. So the timeline itself is a tool for change. Um, so just to end, we know that NIH has said that CBPR is good, community-engaged research is good, increases research trust, research questions are more relevant. I kind of go back to a much more simple view of it, that if we're really doing CBPR, we need to be constantly reflecting of our own capacity and our own ability to run an effective partnership. And I go back to Mary Northridge, who's the editor of American Journal of Public Health, who did this beautiful little piece in 2003. And all she says is, show up, be who you are. I can't pretend I'm Latina. I'm only a white middle class professional who works with uh, you know communities for a very, very long time. So I have to be who I am. But listen, 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 and really believe and promote social justice. And we also go back to Mohan Dutta's work of what is the, this good question, what is the problem from each point of view? What should be done about this problem separately from each point of view? And what can we do together in a good way that will really promote our um, strength and our growth together in a good way? So I think those two, these are my core questions that I kind of um, want to end with, and thanks to the teams, and you'll have, probably have access to this PowerPoint with um, contact information. So, muchísimas gracias. Thank you.